Uh, let's do a quick review of chapter 15. Uh, there's a section that we're going through in our notes of uh, chapter 15 and uh, chapter 16. We're actually going to teach on chapter 16, but I'd like to call your attention to chapter 15 by way of review. And uh, I'd like to just draw your attention, first of all, to chapter 15 and verse 1, where it says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, I'm just like I said, I'm just going to do just a little bit of review. But you recall, uh, if you have your notes tonight or if you were here and, and uh, you're not part of the Bible Institute, that in chapter uh, 15, Peter was confronted by those who were trying to bring the believers, the uh, Gentile believers, back underneath Judaism and underneath the, uh, basically the law of Moses and specifically the Pharisaical type of influence. The Pharisees, you know, were those who in, intended to put more and more laws on people. I think you pretty much know that. But uh, uh, this whole church here at Antioch started as a result of the dispersion following the death of Stephen. And so you had the death of Stephen, which is a pastor has said in his other notes, you know, that was kind of the third strike. They killed uh, John the Baptist, uh, beheaded him. They crucified Jesus. They stoned Stephen. And those are basically the three things which sealed the fate, as it were, of the Jews as far as making them the chosen nation that would receive uh, the gospel. And they, uh, of course, over the, over the centuries had stoned and killed their prophets, so this was nothing new. And after the uh, killing of Stephen, the martyrdom of Stephen, Stephen uh, the uh, church in Antioch uh, was started, and uh, Paul and Barnabas were called to minister to them. And uh, as they ministered there, the Holy Spirit instructed them to take the gospel out to the Gentiles. Um, at, certain, at a certain point, we come to chapter 15, verse 1, where it says, And certain men came. You notice they came there and started laying these burdens on them. And um, Paul and Bartimus got in their face over this issue and said, You know, this isn't the way, uh, this isn't what we received of the Holy Ghost, and this isn't the way we see it, this isn't the way we interpret what's happening, and so we're going to. Uh, we're, we're going to continue to preach to the Gentiles and we're going to continue to uh, walk in liberty, not in law. Um, I think that would be a good example to all of us today. You know, it'd be an excellent study to, uh, uh, to see what kind of burdens are being laid on the brethren, the Baptists today, that are really not in the Bible at all, that are things that they've concocted or thought would be a good idea. And you know, uh, many of them are good ideas, but just because somebody gets a good idea and thinks it would strengthen the brethren doesn't mean it's a law that you have to obey. And, uh, you know, you go to different Baptist universities and colleges and Bible institutes, they all have different good ideas, different dress codes, different standards for living. These are all good. I'm not preaching against any of them. Uh, but I don't think that uh, you can just take uh, whoever's got the most laws and say whoever's got the most rules wins, you know. Um, I don't think it's like that in your family, in your personal life, or at college, or in, the, in, in, in a church. Notice uh, Galatians, if you have a Bible, you can turn there to Galatians 2, verses 4 and 5, where it says, and uh, this is in Galatians 2, verses 4 and 5, uh, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Jesus Christ, that they might bring us unto bondage, unto whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now, that we have a tremendous liberty, and I think by way of review, reviewing chapter 15, I need to stress this. We have a tremendous liberty in Christ Jesus, but we also have a tremendous responsibility to be a testimony, to be a good testimony to other Christians. So don't confuse what I'm saying here uh, with saying that you may sin openly and risk offending a brother. You can't. We're supposed to keep our lives pure from sin. But there are uh, many areas that are, uh, that are up to you and as long as you're not offending someone and they're not a sin for you, the Bible says whatever is not of faith, of course, is sin. And so uh, uh, you notice here in this passage in Galatians 2, verses 4 and 5, it says he came to, to spy out our liberty. And the next line says that they might bring us into bondage. And when you don't have liberty, you have bondage. Now, I went to a real strict Bible college. I went to Hiles Anderson College, probably one of the strictest out there. Um, I know students from the other colleges that used to say, no way would we go to Jack Hiles School. It's too strict. And these were other strict colleges. 
And so I went to a strict college. I was in the dorms for four years, and I was also there two years after that as a married student, and they had a lot of rules. I kept the rules while I was there. I don't think you should uh, rebel against the rules. You voluntarily go to a school. It's like uh, enlisting in the military. Why enlist if you're going to rebel against every little rule? Um, so I'm not against rules, and I'm not a rebel. Uh, but I am saying that we do have liberty uh, as... Uh, as Christian, and, and when I was in Bible college, I didn't have such liberty because I voluntarily put myself into bondage. You follow me? Because liberty is different than bondage. Boy, I had to, to sign in when I came in at night. I had, to, I had to check out in the morning. They had to know if I was at work, if I was at school, uh, if I was uh, out on an activity. We had to sign. You know, everything was bondage. It was all controlled. Uh, they inspected your hair every other day as you came out of chapel. They inspected your room with a white glove. Uh, they used to uh, take your sheet just like in the military and see if it was tucked in just tight enough. Um, you guys think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding at all. Uh, it was, it was, everything was bondage. But, now, but it's not like that in the Christian life. And by the way, that built discipline. I, I, I think that's good to go through that. I also think it's good to get out of that. Amen. But it, it builds its character like Wonder Bread, you know, 12 different ways. And... Um, but in the Christian life, it's not like that. You have liberty, and there's a definite difference between liberty and bondage. Now let's go back to, to the passage here where you see Peter, and this is in the chapter 15 of Acts, where you see Peter standing up, and he says in the first few verses, uh, I'm not sure exactly which verse it is. He says, God made a choice. Let's see, we're in 15. Um, verse 7, chapter 15, verse uh, 7. Men and brethren, you know that how a good while ago God made a choice among us that, by, uh, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear. Now, uh, again, we as Baptists, if you ask any Baptist on the face of the earth, what is the Great Commission? They'll tell you Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And it is. But it should, it should be distinguished there that that Great Commission was given to the Jews to preach the gospel to other Jews that were scattered through Jerusalem and Judea and in the uttermost parts of the earth. And so uh, it was Peter who well, made it very clear uh, that there was no difference between us and them, between the Jews and the Gentiles. Um, in fact, uh, uh, he even asked them why they would tempt God by imposing on the Gentiles bondage that neither they nor their fathers could bear. You know, nobody can keep any law perfectly. No one can. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't inconsistent with the nature of God to offer salvation to the Gentiles anyway, was it? Uh, you look at th throughout the Old Testament, uh, the gospel was offered uh, to, the, to, to all nations, basically, but the Jews were the ones that were selectively chosen because Abraham had great faith. But God has always blessed faith. For example, in the New Testament, Jesus uh, came out of the first part of his ministry you remember whenever he cleansed the temple and, 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 and bound up the cords and drove out the money changers and threw over the tables, and then he, he left. And on his way out, the Bible says he must needs pass through Samaria. You recall that? He talked to a woman who was the town prostitute at the well. And if you read that passage, you'll realize Jesus wasn't preaching the gospel to a Jew. He was preaching to a Samaritan. And secondly, he said the harvest truly is, is a plenteous, but the laborers are few. And so uh, he, even Jesus would preach to a non-Jew, a non-Judaic, Pharisaic, law-keeping Jew. God has always offered the gospel to anyone who would have faith. But based on the uh, uh, killing of uh, John the Baptist, based on the crucifixion of Christ, based on the stoning of Stephen, the uh, Jews were put on the shelf and the gospel went to the Gentiles. So Peter stands up here in the first part of chapter 15, and then after that, you've got Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas uh, stand up. Look at verse 12, 15, verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. You know, these were Jewish brethren that, uh, that he was talking to here. And notice that they declared what miracles and wonders God wrought among the Gentiles. Why in the world do you think God would work miracles among the Gentiles when it's the Jews that require a sign? Well, the answer is very simple. They're having to prove to the Jews that God is accepting the Gentiles. And so you have to have signs to prove anything to these guys. 
You understand me? It wasn't the Gentiles that required the sign. It was the, the signs had to be done among the Gentiles because they had already been done among the Jews. You follow me? If there would have been no signs among the Gentiles, the Jews would have never believed. And so that's the purpose, I believe, for this passage. And then quickly we go to James. Notice uh, James here is the voice of authority in the Jerusalem church. Now, this guy James is the brother of Jesus Christ. This is not James, you know, the first apostle. And James is a very interesting fellow. If you ever get the chance to read the complete works of Josephus, you'll, uh, Josephus talks about James, the brother of Christ. And after Christ was crucified, James became the leading bishop of the Christian church in the city of Jerusalem. And he was greatly respected. And in fact, it's said that the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem. Josephus says that it's, it's because uh, that James was murdered the brother of Jesus was murdered, is the reason that Titus came through in 70 AD and destroyed Jerusalem. Can you believe that? Now, we all know it was because they, you know, because they killed John the Baptist and crucified Jesus and stoned Stephen. We know that it was that total rejection, and especially the crucifixion of Christ, right, that brought the Romans and their legions in in 70 AD. But according to the Roman historian, or I should say Jewish historian, Josephus, who traveled with the Romans, he says it was because they killed the brother of Jesus, James, because he was a holy and pure and righteous man. And when the Jews turned on James and killed James, it was because of that, that God's wrath was kindled because such a righteous man had been killed. That was the take by Josephus. So anyway, this guy James was very highly respected back in Jerusalem. You say, how respected was he? Well, again, you have to hark back to uh, Galatians chapter 2, if you have a Bible and you want to turn there. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. You say, how powerful was this guy James in the uh, religious community? Well, in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, it says, When Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that, certain came, everyone, from James. So there were certain people that knew James and hung around James back at Jerusalem that came and visited. And... Uh, Notice it says that he withdrew and he separated himself. This is Peter who did this. You understand? This is Peter, the rock. This is Peter whose shadow went across sick people and they were healed. This is Peter who stood up here in, in uh, chapter 15 and said it was by my mouth that the Gentiles received the gospel. This is Peter, right? But Peter was so afraid and so intimidated by James that when James' embassy came from Jerusalem, it says in my King James Bible, fearing them. You with me? That's how powerful this guy James was. Even Peter feared James. He had a, a very high position in the Jerusalem assembly. And so here uh, we've talked in chapter 15 about Peter standing up. We've talked about Barnabas and Paul standing up. And now we're talking about James standing up here. And in... Uh, in chapter uh, 15 of Acts, James stands up and he says that uh, God is going to save the Gentiles and that God has accepted the Gentiles. And he quotes a passage out of Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. And uh, he, uh, he quotes this passage saying that there's a great multitude, a great number of people from various tongues that are going to be accepted. And uh, even Isaiah, I think perhaps in your notes you have Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 4, where it says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain, and by the way, in prophecy, a mountain is always a great nation or a great kingdom. It says, The mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of what? On top of mountains. So what are those mountains? Those are other kingdoms and other nations. And... Uh, uh, it says, and many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. That's the nation of the Lord. How do we know that? It says, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways. So James basically says uh, that the Gentiles have been included. Um, and that uh, uh, this liberty that, that Paul was just talking about is very consistent with the nature of God. Um, let's go to... Um, I'm just finishing up this review here, but notice uh, James mentions four things. Four things here. Chapter 15. Okay, uh, verse 29. Chapter 15, verse 29. 
These are the four things that you're supposed to abstain from to keep your testimony pure. Uh, meats offered to idols, that's number one. From blood, don't, in other words, don't drink or, or eat anything that hasn't had the blood drained from it. it sounds gross, but back then they thought it was neat to, uh, to eat things that, uh, were, that were never, uh, you know, didn't have the blood drained from them, things that were strangled, basically. So you got things offered to idols, things that hadn't uh, had the blood drained from them before they were cooked. Number three, things strangled. And number four, from fornication. That's any sort of sexual sin outside of marriage. And so he says, if you do those things, you'll do well. And, uh, you know, this goes along with the passage over in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13. And you might want to underline that or put a cross-reference to it, because this is a really good passage. 1 Corinthians 8, 13. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I'll eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Another good passage is in Romans chapter 14 and verse 21 where it says, It is good ne neither to eat flesh. Now why is that? Because at that time certain people were saying it's a sin to uh, eat any sort of meat. You're supposed to only eat vegetables and fruit. And to purify the body, you stayed away from eating meat. Uh, they would use that passage back in Genesis where there was a time whenever people and animals started becoming meat eaters. And so they would say, to be absolutely pure like it was back in the garden, and we've got a lot of that new age thinking today, don't we? Let's get back to Mother Earth and back to the garden and all that. And so they'd say, don't eat any meat. But God has made it very clear in the Bible that uh, all things are pure and that you can eat any sort of meat. And then the second thing is drinking wine. There were those who uh, taught that it was wrong to, to drink anything of that nature. And, of course, you look in your Bible and study out that, and you'll find that that's not the case. And so uh, you've got to watch out for people who are always laying burdens on other people. The last, So he says, basically, for testimony's sake, refrain from these four things. And you can also find other passage in, passages in your Bibles besides uh, the one in Romans 14, 21, where it talks about a couple things that pharisaical type of groups try to lay on you, as well as these four things that James mentioned. So, in summary, chapter 15 is establishing the ministry of Paul to the Gentiles. And you've got uh, James doing it there at the very end. You've got Paul uh, and Barnabas doing it. And then in the beginning, you've got Peter. So you've got these three times these people stand up and establish the ministry of Paul. Uh, the special call that Peter had to Cornelius, most of you are familiar with that, where he saw the sheep that was let down out of heaven three times, right? Uh, that, was a, uh, that was the Holy Spirit confirming the, uh, uh, the message and ministry to the Gentiles. And here you have certain Jewish brethren who had traveled from Jerusalem to this church in Antioch and were trying to, again, put the shackles on them and they would have nothing to do with it. Now this leads us to Lesson 14, which is in Chapter 16, and this starts the second missionary journey of Paul. Second missionary journey. And uh, in your notes you should have Roman numeral number one, Paul and Barnabas, part company. And let's look at chapter 16, and let's read the first uh, few verses here. It says, uh, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of uh, by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and he took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Now, don't you find it a bit ironic that here he just gone through this whole discourse? You got, you know, like I just said, you got these guys standing up on three different little little sermons. These guys stand up and they say, we're no longer to be under the law, folks. We're to be under perfect liberty. And then here, just a few verses later, chapter 16, you've got Paul picking up this young man, Timothy, whose mother was a Jewess who believed, father was a Gentile, a Greek, and he was uncircumcised. Why was he uncircumcised? Because his father wasn't a Jew. And you know, if dad's not circumcised, junior's not going to get circumcised, right? And so Paul picks him up and says, well, you know, I know I just said that, but, you know, we've got to, we've got to do something to, uh, to, to be able to get in the door and to be acceptable. You say, well, well, Brother Randy, that sounds really inconsistent. No, it's perfectly consistent with what he just took time to say about not offending another believer. That's kind of hard to swallow, isn't it? I mean, here it seems like he's putting Timothy right back under this pharisaical law, but he's not. He's doing it for the brethren's sake. It never says here that Paul said anything to Timothy about, hey, Timothy, 
If you don't get circumcised, you're not going to be saved. You're not going to be accepted by God. And you certainly will never receive, quote, the filling of the Holy Ghost. He never says that, does he? So really, he's not putting Timothy back under the law. What he's doing is he's putting Timothy in a state where the message will be accepted. Now, there's got to be some kind of a message here that we receive from this. Because he just got finished saying, don't, you know, don't drink anything with blood uh, if it's going to offend someone. Don't eat anything that's strangled if it's going to offend someone. Don't eat anything that's been offered to idols if it's going to offend someone. And, and, and make sure you don't get involved in any sort of immorality because that definitely will offend people. You with me now? And then he says, but in order that we don't offend, we're going to keep a certain portion of the law. Now, we, you know, here in Linwood have a really, really, really tough time understanding this because we really have no concept of Jewish life. We may think we do, but we really don't understand, but maybe one tenth of the way it was back in the Jewish life. Let me give you an example. Back then, if a rabbi or a teacher talked to a woman, they had to go through ceremonial cleansing for seven days. How do you ladies feel about that this morning or this evening? You see, that's how bad it was. Whenever the teachers of the law would see a leper or a paralyzed person or um, like the woman that has the issue of blood, you know, that touched the hem of Jesus' garment. Uh, if they saw anyone like that coming down the street, they would hide behind buildings and throw rocks at them and tell them, don't come down this street, you'll contaminate my street. This is the way it was in Jewish life. They were so concerned the most defiling thing that they could do would be to come near or touch a dead body or to come near a leper. And then thirdly was to come near a woman. You guys are happy. I'm, this is good preaching, isn't it? I'm, I'm winning the crowd over here, aren't I? I can tell. The spirit is moving. But see, we really don't understand the way it was in Jewish life. We really don't. And we don't even, and really don't even appreciate, especially you ladies and you lepers and you dead people here. Amen don't really understand the liberty that we have in Christ Jesus. You say, well, I'm not in that class. No, you're not. Not right here in 1997. But if you were a Jewess, like Timothy's mother was, you would have been ostracized by everybody in your nation because you were married to a Greek. And if you had gone to the temple with this boy and tried to, to, to circumcise him, guess what? They wouldn't even let you in the temple because you would be defiling their temple. And don't dare bring that half Greek boy in here to be circumcised because we're not touching him. He's not a Jew. You with me? The only thing they could even touch was a Jewish man could touch another Jewish man. That was it. As far as a handshake or a hug or the Bible says, greet the brethren with a holy kiss. You see? So here you have a boy, Timothy, that was told to be uh, circumcised. Why? Because, let me tell you, if he hadn't been circumcised, he wouldn't even have gotten in the door with Timothy to preach to these other Jews. They wouldn't even be in the room with a Gentile who was uncircumcised. You follow me? So he had to circumcise Timothy, not to put Timothy under the law, but just so they could get in the same building and preach to these other guys. That's how serious it was. Now, it was, it says here in the passage, some days after that Paul suggested that he and Barnabas uh, visit the Gentiles again. These cities are listed in the first missionary journey. Barnabas suggested that they take John Mark. That's in your notes. For those of you that are filling in notes that are still awake. Um, John Mark. Uh, Paul would have none of it. And John had disappointed Paul on their first journey. So most of you know that John Mark didn't work out. He kind of flaked out. He was immature. And uh, he was considered unstable. And according to Paul, he still needed some maturing. And so there was a contention that arose between Paul and Barnabas. And it became so sharp that they parted company. Now, here's a situation to behold. Here, too, uh, the greatest men in the New Testament are in such a huff that they part company uh, over the choice of a traveling companion. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Is it possible that believers can both be full, of, be full of the Spirit and be full of God's Word and want God's will in their lives and still disagree uh, to the point where there would be a division? It's commonly taught in churches where the Spirit is really held up even more than, say, the person of Jesus Christ is, uh, that uh, those that are filled with the Spirit will always agree. But nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, the Gospels teach us that that's, it's actually the opposite. We usually conclude that those who disagree with us are not filled with the Spirit. And that's generally how it works. But in any case, Barnabas takes Mark with him and he sails to Cyprus. It says in Acts chapter 4, you can turn there if you'd like to, Acts chapter 4 and verse 36. Quote, 
and Hoses, or Joses, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which means, or is interpreted, the son of consolation. He was a Levite and of the country of Cyprus. And so this guy Barnabas, his name is Hoses, or Joses, and uh, he takes Barnabas, takes uh, uh Barnabas takes Mark with him, and of course, uh, Paul recruits Silas and takes him. Now, do you have this uh, concordance uh, definition in your notes, down at the bottom of your notes? Do you have that in your notes, guys? Do you? Okay. Notice it says silence, uh, Silas means woody or wooden. Wooden would be an uh, indication to a Greek that he was strong and firm, sort of like a building material, like a stud or a truss or something like that. It means someone who is strong. Um, and so uh, he's a Jew, some sort of a Hellenistic Jew, it says here. And uh, uh, it, you have a little uh, outline. I'll read this uh, for you folks who don't have the notes. It says, Silas means woody or wooden, and he was an eminent member of the early Christian church, described under that name in Acts. He is also called Silvanus in Paul's epistles. He first appears as one of the leaders of the church at Jerusalem. Over in Acts 15, 22, he holds the office of an inspired teacher. Uh, in 1533, Acts 1533. His name, derived from the Latin silva, wood, betokens him as a Hellenistic Jew, and he appears to have been a Roman citizen. Over in Acts 1637, he's appointed as a delegate to accompany Paul and Barnabas on their return to Antioch with a decree of the Council of Jerusalem, Acts 15, 22 and 23. Having accomplished this mission, he returned to Jerusalem, uh, fifth, uh, Acts 5, I think that should be 533. He must, however, have been immediately uh, revisited. He must have immediately revisited Antioch, for we find him selected by Paul as the companion of his second missionary journey, Acts fifteen forty through seventeen ten. At Berea, he was left behind with Timothy, while Paul proceeded uh, to Athens, Acts seventeen fourteen, and we hear nothing more of his movements until he rejoins the apostles in Corinth, Acts eighteen five. His presence at Corinth is several times noted. We see this, this in 2 Corinthians 1.19 and 1 Thessalonians 1 and 2 Thessalonians 1.1. Uh, 1. I guess they repeated 1 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1 and 2 Thessalonians 1.1. 1, 1. Okay, let's go back to the book of Acts and look at the first three verses. Notice, first of all, that Timothy's mother was a Jew. His father was a Greek. Now, you know that these kind of marriages were frowned upon by the Orthodox Jews, as I just made a point to you about. However, outside of Jerusalem, out in the outlying areas, they weren't quite so strict, and they were tolerated a little bit more. Um, Pro Paul had probably won him to Christ on his first missionary journey, and Timothy had a great advantage. Who can tell me what that advantage was tonight? Just go ahead and say if you, tell me, if, if you, if you know what it is. Well, he had a godly mother and grandmother, and uh, that is a great advantage, isn't it? How many of you grew up in a home where you didn't have Christian parents? Raise your hand if neither one of your parents were Christian. Okay, I'd say about half the crowd. How many of you grew up in a house where only one of your parents was a Christian? Raise your hand. Only one. Again, about a third of the crowd. How many uh, of you grew up in a home where both of your parents were Christians? I mean, they went, not just in nominally, but they went to church and they were sold out. Raise your hand. Okay, so you can see it's just about divided equally here. Uh, and those of you that... that uh, uh, I think you'll know that those of you that uh, had Christian parents had a great advantage. You probably knew more about the Bible and that type of thing on accident than those who get saved later on in life. You really, If you get saved later on in life, you really have to hit it, don't you? I mean, to catch up. And the problem is, uh, as pastors said many times, as many times you've got some bad habits and scars of the world that you uh, have to get past. But in any case, you notice here um, that he is, his mother was a Jewess. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, and you can turn there if you'd like to, 2 Timothy 3, 15. It says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now again, uh, I was saved when I was only four years old. Um, for some of you, you haven't even been saved four years yet especially the Sunday morning crowd. Now, we have a crowd here on Wednesday night that's probably been saved, you know, the longest. If you were to take the average uh, Christian here, how, how long they've been saved, it's probably longer on a Wednesday night or a Sunday night crowd than on a Sunday morning crowd. But um, I was saved when I was four, year old, four years old. We used to have family devotions every night. My mom uh, had us uh, memorizing scriptures before we could read or write or, or even basically draw and, and stay within the lines, which I still can't do very well. But uh, we were memorizing scripture and 
and uh, uh, had Bible studies today. They have Bible videos. You know, you just plug the kid in front of a Bible video. Back then, parents really had to teach the scriptures to people. Things have really progressed a long way, haven't they? And uh, so I was saved when I was just a little boy. Um, many times I find when I'm preaching up north, uh, I'll talk about something and I'll hark back to a Bible story. And you know, if I hadn't learned those Bible stories back when I was three, four, five, six, seven years old, I wouldn't have those in the back of my mind. Uh, there have been stories told of young men who grow up and they rebel, as teenagers often do, and then they go off into the service or they go off to college or something. And it's those Bible verses that they've memorized. And it's those Bible stories and those biblical principles that they have in the back of their mind that brings them back around to Christ after they've uh, made their mistakes and they, the regret sets in and the reality that the world has nothing to offer. When that sets in, then they realize what, what it was all about and, it's, and they get a little bit of wisdom. And uh, praise God for that. You know, I say that uh, any time the Lord pries open the doors of our heart enough just to let a little bit of light in, that we ought to just, just help him as much as we can. You know, let's not fight against that. I, I honestly believe that we, have, as a human race, have uh, degraded and degenerated ourselves so much since the time of Adam that we really can barely comprehend spiritual things. I mean, it's all we can do to pray every day and read our Bible every day and hold on to a spiritual thought longer than just a minute or two. Um, I don't think it used to be like that. I, the Bible says Adam walked and talked with God in the cool of the evening. I think we had a much greater propensity to understand spiritual things and to actually live and follow through on spiritual truth. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could just do a portion of what we knew? You know that story about the guy who was selling books to the, to the farmers, the young man who was out there selling books door-to-door -to, -door to farmers, how to farm better? The old farmer looked at him and said, man, I don't farm half as good as I know how to now. Why would I want to buy another book? You know? And I think that's the way we are as Christians, right? But um, I think, I think we've, uh, we need to just really help the Lord out and work with God a little bit in this process of maturing. Let's not fight against the Holy Spirit. Let's not let our will butt heads with his spirit. Now, I said that uh, the circumcision of Timothy, I'll get back on track here. The circumcision of Timothy was for a testimony to the unsaved Jews. Now, he had already trusted Christ. He didn't need uh, any, sort, any sort of circumcision, but it was a testimony to the unsaved Jews. Um, it's important to note that Paul taught liberty from the law and that the, the Jews and the Gentiles were under grace. We don't have any uh, right to give up our liberty, but we do have the liberty to give up our rights. And, uh, and it's demonstrated over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 through, through 29. I would recommend you turn to that passage. It's an excellent passage. Again, 1 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 23. Quote, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. And I think you should underline or highlight or circle those two words, expedient. Expedient means good for or works well. How many of you know what to expedite means? It means it goes better, right? It goes faster. So, uh, you know, expedient means you're helping out. All things don't help out. All things don't make people grow faster spiritually. There are things which I'm convinced are not a sin for you because you're perfectly strong and they won't cause you to stumble by doing or, or being involved in these things. But man, you get around somebody else that has a weakness in that area and it'll just destroy that person in a flash. Okay? So don't do something that's not expedient for another. You with me? Uh, and then notice lawful here. Now, we don't really think of being under the law because we don't have a Jewish background. But who was he talking to? People with a Jewish background. And so he says, not all things are expedient. All things are lawful. Uh, uh, all, all things are lawful for me. But notice the word here, all things edify, not. Edify has to do with edifice. It has to do with building. So he says, not all things are going to help speed things up and be helpful. And not all things are going to help build or make things stronger. He's using two words here. One has to do with motion and one has to do with structure. And so he says uh, in this passage, 1 Corinthians 10, let no man seek his own. Now that's what it comes down to, isn't it, Christian? It's all about doing what you want. You say, well, you don't understand. I have liberty in Christ. I'll do this if I want to. Well, yeah, you have the right to do that, but you also have the liberty to give up your rights. You with me? You have liberty to give up your rights. And so it says here... Uh, and it goes further. And I notice in this passage, it says, Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Now, what that means is if you go over to somebody's house and they lay some, some sort of stew in front of you, 
or some sort of a steak, don't ask what kind of meat that is. <laughs> if you have to ask, maybe you shouldn't eat. Amen. But don't ask. Because uh, even though your conscience is fine, the person that's sitting next to you might think it's a sin to eat that kind of meat. And you don't want to do something intentionally that would offend him. He says, just notice the passage here. It just says, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness of thereof. So if you get around any sort of Christian today in 1996 or whatever year this is, and they say, you know, you're not supposed to eat a certain kind of food or whatever, you just show them this passage. Hey, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You can eat any kind of vegetable, any kind of fruit, eat any kind of meat. Now notice this. It says, if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and you need to be disposed to go, whatsoever set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if somebody says to you, this is offered in sacrifice to idols, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to push away from the table. And it says right here, it says, uh, eat not for his sake that showed it. You ever, everybody with me? If you were by yourself in your house, you could eat it. If it was you and your husband, you and your wife, you and your kids. You could go ahead and eat that. But if you're with another Christian and it's going to offend that person, don't do it for his sake. That doesn't, this doesn't put you under the law. It shows that you want to build up and help build up this other person and make him grow faster and grow stronger. And it's, it's very clear here in this passage. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. Now, this is a line that everybody should memorize. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Everybody with me on that? Why do you sit around and judge me? Now, I don't know how grown or how matured you guys are spiritually, but I think we'd all agree that our own spiritual welfare is a full-time occupation, right? We don't have any spare time or calories to waste trying to judge other people and make sure they're right with God. It's a full-time thing for me to make sure Randy Blue is right with God, right? I need to focus in on studying God's Word and learning God's Word and praying and getting answers to my prayer and being a good father to my children, a good husband to my wife, a good employer a good employee to my employer, being a good testimony everywhere I go. I don't have time to check out Ron Lister's Christianity or somebody, you know what I mean? I don't have time to look at other people and, and, and waste time and energy judging them. I have a full-time thing just keeping myself and my family online. And all God's people said, amen. amen. I mean, that's it. That's, the, that's as, as much truth as you're going to get out of, the, out of the word tonight. It says right here, why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? But the case here is, if another person does put their nose in your liberty, don't smack them upside the head. And don't call them an idiot. And don't correct them with God's word. What does he say here? Push away from the table and say, hey, if that bothers you, I won't do it. As long as you're in the presence of that person, don't do anything that would cause that person to sin. Because if you do, you're guilty, according to God's word. Everybody with me? So uh, keep that in mind as you, uh, in, in different things that you do in your life. Now, I want to say that Paul's burden was for the churches. The decrees written by the brethren over in Acts 15, which I just reviewed for you, are concerned with Gentile testimony among the Jews. This is a news of liberty. This is the news of Paul's ministry. Uh, and it's all among the Jews. I believe that this news that he gave them of liberty and of his ministry strengthened them and established them in the faith. Uh, notice that there, were, there was an addition of many converts here in chapter 16. Let's go to, to verse uh, 4. Chapter 16, verse 4. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees to keep that were ordained by the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. So you notice that they increased here. Now look at verse 6. When they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. So they were come to Messiah. They essayed to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Messiah, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And after he'd seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Now, uh, evangelism 
and edification are equally important. You know, some pastors attempt to build a church without winning souls, but they fail miserably because there's no evangelism. There are those who are great soul winners, but they fail misery, miserably because there's no edification. Um, you'll usually find that a person tends to have one sort of bent or another, one sort of tendency or another. There are people who are just gung-ho for soul winning, but they don't have a natural tendency to care and teach and mature those that God has given them. And then there are others who care and teach and mature, but they don't have a natural tendency to go get more. Okay? And so God has given different gifts in the church to help edify. One of the reasons male and female argue and fight so much in marriage is they don't accept the fact that they have different strengths given to help each other. Okay? And it's the same way in the church. You have people with different strengths given to help each other. Um, but believers have to be established by sound doctrine. And by the way, winning souls is not the end. It's only the beginning. The end is to develop mature believers. Now, first you have to make them believers, okay? I agree, soul winning. And then you have to make them mature. And uh, neither one is, is the end. The edifying or the soul, they work together. And so they have a mature believer that has a mature life that will glorify God. Let's go... Uh, I want to uh, give you a few notes here on this passage we just read. Did I stop at verse 11? Did I stop at the end of verse 10? Did I? Okay, let's go to 15. Therefore, uh, starting in verse 11. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course uh, to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is a chief city, part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake to the woman who resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, came and worshipped God and heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Would that ever happen? Would any Jews ever talk to a woman, first of all? No. Would they have ever gone to her house? Double no. Because she was not the right uh, race. And so... Here you have a testimony of Paul attempting, and I'm talking about verses 5 through 15 now. We have an uh, attempt of Paul to travel to Asia, but the Spirit here refused to let him go. We aren't told what means the Spirit used to forbid them. It may have been a vision, maybe it was a still small voice. I don't know why, but apparently God had other plans for them. And while he was at Troas here, Paul had this night vision of a man. Notice it was a man, not a woman. Even though Lydia, who sold purple, was a woman, he had a vision of a man. Okay? And this man is standing and he's pleading with them to come over and it says, help us. And so uh, the destination was Philippi, which was a chief city of Macedonia. The writer says they were there certain days and they saw a group of women who gathered by the river to pray. And so this small missionary party sat down and they spoke to the woman. And verse 14 tells us that one woman by the name of Lydia believed Paul's witness and she was saved. It says whose heart the Lord opened. Now, this is Paul's first convert in Europe. Many things are significant about this. I mentioned she was a woman, but the vision was of a man calling for them to go to Macedonia. But there was no men there except for the men that were with Paul's group. Now, you say, why would God do that? Well, first of all, he wanted to show them that he was removing the difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Secondly, he, that there's no difference anymore between male and female in God. Otherwise, it would still be the way it was back then at Jesus' time. And so, uh, you know, I believe that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the best friend a woman can have. There is no, there is no teaching that elevates women more than the teaching of, of Jesus Christ. Notice the relationship that Jesus had with women. Now, I'm teaching a series right now on the life of Christ in my church. And I'm amazed the more I study about how Jesus, who was a Jew, by the way, under the law, he was under the law, how he treated women. It's a wonderful God, isn't he? And so, here on this bank of this unnamed river... One woman believed the gospel and was saved. It wasn't the town of fathers. It wasn't Jews. It wasn't the elite. It was a woman who was a seller of purple. Um, down at the bottom of the page, men, notice that, uh, and, and ladies, in Mark 16, 16, it says, uh, she had water baptism. And notice it says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. You see that? So she was baptized here. Um, her baptism was a burial and a resurrection from a watery grave. 
As you folks know, baptism pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Completely different baptism than the baptism of the kingdom. Let's go to the next page in your notes. At the top of the page, you understand that there are those who have a certain theology that thinks that this, they think that this baptism replaces the Jewish circumcision. But believer's baptism has nothing to do with circumcision. The uh, Jews thought that on the eighth day, if a child lived to its eighth day, they would circumcise this child, that he would be considered a true Jew by his circumcision. That's why circumcision was so important. It had to do with putting away the uncleanness of the Gentiles. Of course, the Gentiles were uncircumcised, so they retained their uncleanness. And uh, today we have believers who think that uh, baptism places someone in a state of grace. Such as infant baptism, baptize a baby, he's placed in a state of grace. I was actually reading a pastor's commentary the other day, and it said that you can have faith for another. Your faith is, this is in a commentary that we, us pastors get notes out of, and it said that you can have faith for another. Witness infant baptism. That's what it said. So you actually had, this was in a, in a series of notes where it said, that's what infant baptism is for, where you have faith for another. And baptism places them in this state of grace. Hyper-dispensationalists who don't think that baptism belongs in this dispensation aren't sure why she was baptized. If baptism didn't belong in this dispensation, why would he have baptized this woman, Lydia, after she was saved? So we know that baptism is for this era. But let's not forget about Baptist briders. We have some of those guys in this area who believe that water baptism is the door to the local church. But you see, baptism followed her conversion. It had nothing to do with apostolic authority. It had nothing to do with one church authorizing another church. It didn't place her in grace. didn't place her in any local church because no church existed at, at, at her, in her town. Now, I mentioned that some people use this text right here as a basis for infant baptism. Now, if you look closely, ladies, you'll see this here, since most of you have had infants at one time or another. Now, where in the world would somebody get infant baptism out of this passage? Well... It says there, and her household. She was saved and her household. What well, doesn't say any babies are there, does it? But those who believe in baby sprinkling will say, well, she was a lady. Certainly she had children. Right? Doesn't say she was a virgin. Doesn't say, you know, it says she was a woman. Women get together and talk about their families. And it says her whole household. There isn't one verse where any infant in the Bible was baptized, ever. And there's no verse teaching that infants are supposed to be baptized and that the faith of this woman saved any of her infants. But this is all the evidence that these folks use. Notice her spirit of gratitude. You see that? Her spirit of gratitude. She was... Uh, uh, verse 15, it says, If you judge me to be faithful, come in my house and abide there. And she constrained us. She had them over for dinner. She let them stay there. She was a great hospitable type of host. A great example for people everywhere, men and women. Finally, I'd like you to notice the, the last section here. Well, actually, the second to the last section. I'm running out of time here. But let me just take five more minutes and uh, maybe ten. And uh, notice here in verses 16 through 18. It came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which had brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee by the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. Now in this passage, they're confronted by evil spirits. They had one convert. It wasn't a man. And uh, this, uh, this word divination, spirit of divination, comes from the word plutho, P-L-U-T-H-O. It has, we, we would use it in the sense of a snake, like a python, okay? It has to do with something that has a hold on something. And uh, there's some sort of demon controlled this young woman. She followed Paul around for days. We're on the next page now, guys. She followed Paul around for days, and she proclaimed to everyone that they were the servants of the Most High God. Look at verse 17. It says that she, had, that, that she, she told people that they had the way of salvation. Paul rebuked this evil spirit, commanded her to... Uh, commanded it to come out of her, took away the financial gain. Notice in verse 19, and you can read this for yourself, it says that uh, there were false accusations, there were beatings, there was all sort of torment. Why? Because they were losing big bucks when they lost this psychic. There, nobody was there to answer their 1-900 number, apparently. 
the psychic network. And uh, so they had this loss of income. Now let's look at verse 19, all the way up through verse 40. You see, uh, you know the story. I'm not going to read the whole story. This is the story of Paul and Silas, you know how they were in jail and the place was shaken and they were let out, but they didn't leave because they wanted to witness to this guy. You know this story, I'm sure. And then in verse 30 is, it, is probably a classic verse in your New Testament. It says, and he brought them out and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, wouldn't that be wonderful if we went down to Fred Meyer, went down to the mall, went to, this, went to work, and people said, what must I do to be saved? Right? But we'd be the greatest soul winners around, wouldn't we? That's not the way it goes. But it did here. And so um, in this passage, um, they had an earthquake. Top of the next page. And it loosed their bonds. The doors flew open. Everybody could have walked out, but of course they didn't. Uh, but he was sure that his prisoners had escaped, but the prisoners hadn't escaped. And of course they sang songs and prayed prayers and won this guy to the Lord. Most important question anyone can ask is in verse 30 where it says, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And uh, there are people who say, uh, you can believe in Jesus if you want, but you have to do some works. And when you get back into the works thing, you get back into the bondage thing. Remember, there's liberty and there's bondage. Um, Seventh-day Adventist says, unless you keep the Sabbath, you're not going to be saved. Uh, Pentecostals and other uh, people who believe uh, this Aryan theology say that you must be saved by believing in Jesus Christ, but you must endure to the end. And this is this thing where if you do enough bad things or if you don't do enough good things, you don't remain in a state of grace, right? Armenian theology. And so uh, here we have a case of someone who must be uh, identified with Jesus Christ. That's what baptism is about, identifying in his death, burial, and resurrection. Let's go to the last page on your notes, and I'll just finish by saying that Paul and Silas returned to the jail. Again, you know the story. One reason they returned to the jail is because they were innocent. And then the other reason they returned was the safety of the jailer. What kind of Christians would they be if they ran away from jail and then they got this guy saved and then they he let the Romans kill him by, by way of punishment? That'd be a great testimony, wouldn't it? And uh, so they stayed because they won this guy to the Lord and they were concerned with his safety and because they were innocent. And so let me just summarize chapter 16 by saying that Paul and Barnabas decided to visit the church that they had established on their first missionary journey. Barnabas uh, wanted to take uh, John Mark. Remember, John Mark flaked out on the first trip. So Paul said, no way, I'm not taking him. I'm taking Silas. So Barnabas took John Mark with him. And uh, they went on, Barnabas and John Mark went on to Cyprus. And uh, later on, uh, Paul and Silas recruited Timothy. Because uh, Timothy was half Jew and half Greek, he had to be circumcised. And uh, they traveled, uh, as they traveled, they wanted to go to, uh, to Asia, but the Holy Spirit would not let them go to Asia. Instead, they went by Europe. They went to Macedonia, which is in Europe. Uh, some of you remember Alexander the Great from world history. His father was Philip of Macedon, right? And uh, so it was, a, it was a, an area of Europe and it was they, it, they had a vision of a man, a man saying, come and preach to us. But who did he preach to? Ended up being a woman, Lydia, showing there's no difference between Jew and Greek and there's no difference between male and female. And then later on, they were cast into prison because by some businessmen who were upset because they had exercised a demon from a woman who told the future and was kind of a psychic. And uh, while they were there, God sent an earthquake, broke open the doors, and they had the uh, ability to leave, but they were innocent, so they stayed. They said, hey, we're going to be a testimony, and they won this guy to the Lord and won his family. And uh, basically, uh, it, we want to see here that God's blessing was on the ministry of Paul as it had been on the ministry of Peter, and that, and that there was a transition going on here from the ministry to the Jews. Now the ministry is going to the Gentiles. And as you know, Acts is a transi transitory type of book. Okay, let's stand together.